Hi everybody, Keith Tanner here from Fly Miata, and today for our Facebook Live, I'm going to be talking about a car that's been in my family for almost a quarter century, and this is it, Miata 338. I'll answer the first question right away. Um, well, speaking of questions, tell you what, if you have questions, put them in the comments. If you're watching this live, we'll do our best to answer it live. If we're watching this in the future, then we will do our best to answer the questions in the future. We don't have the technology for me to answer future questions live now. I apologize for that. We're working on it. Um, so, there you go. And of course, all the usual social media stuff. If you like this, like, comment, subscribe. You know how that works. You've seen these videos. Anyway, Miata 338. It's called Miata 338 because of its serial number. It actually is Miata number 338 off the production line. Um, it was built in April 1989, which means it's coming up on 34 years old in a couple of months. Um, not the very first car, the 001, was not sold to the public. It was a pre-production car. I'm not sure exactly when the changeover happened. I know that Miata 26, I believe it is, which belongs to a friend of mine, that was a pre-production car that was supposed to have been crushed and got, it has quite a story of its own. That, we're not telling that story today. Um, I'm not sure exactly when the cutover happened, but basically this is a very, very early car. And that's actually the main reason it entered our family. Um, my father decided he wanted to get a Miata because he had a Miata expert on hand. And uh, we found this particular car at a Hyundai dealership. It was looking a little ratty. I spotted the VIN number and, well, dad wanted to preserve what there was of it. So there you go, Miata number 338. It's a Canadian car. Um, so it's got some interesting little differences. It's got some differences because it's an early model. Um, but it's also got some because it's a Canadian model, which was a little different than the U.S. cars because of various legislative, ch legislative changes. So the car's been in the family since 1999. We bought it in April 4th or 6th or something like that, 1999, and almost immediately did a little restoration work, cleaned it up, that sort of thing, and almost immediately loaned it to my friends Axel and Steffi Winmuller, who then drove it down to Texas from Ottawa, Canada, for the Miata World 99 event which was the 10th anniversary event. It was a big deal. They gave away a car, all sorts of excitement. Um, we got some pictures of it parked beside Miata number 500,000, which had just been produced, um, and then drove it back again, stopped off at Deals Gap on the way, stopped off at Performance Buyers Club um, in Virginia on the way, and then my parents drove it around for years. Uh, my dad took it on a solo trip out to Newfoundland. It was one of the support vehicles for us in 2008 when we took the Targa Miata to Newfoundland for the Targa Newfoundland. I think it was also driven out as a support vehicle in 2011 as well. Um, it's been driven out here several times. I rebuilt the engine in 2002 because it was a little rocky. But basically, it's never been a show car. It's never been preserved. It's a driver. It's always been owned and treated as if it was a real car. And that's how I'm going to keep treating it. I'm not going to just wrap this thing in bubble wrap and never touch it again. I'm going to preserve it, I'm going to keep it the way more or less it is, and I'm going to drive it because honestly that's what they're for. If you don't drive them, they're not, they're not doing what they were built to do. Do we have any questions yet, Mike? Okay. Let me check my notes and see if I missed anything in the history. I don't think so. Um, the reason I have it now, my father passed away a few years ago, and I could have sold the car because, I mean, I have, 1990, I have NA Miatas. I already have a red N.A. Miata, I even have a red 1990 Canadian N.A. Miata, but I mean, seriously, I couldn't. So there you go. I, uh, I brought it, drove it into the States. Um, I completed the importation process actually just before Christmas, so it is now, it has its citizenship. So there you go. We are both imports. Um, yeah, I think that's about all I've got for the history of the car. The hardtop actually, it never wore a hardtop before. This is the hardtop off my own Miata that I've owned, since this, I've owned this hardtop since 1993. Um, but since I'm not driving that particular car these days, I figured we would bring it over and, and put it on this, uh, this poor little thing, because they are fun with hardtops. So, there you go. So, um, this is basically a time capsule. And one of the reasons I like having it around is because it's not heavily modified, I'm surrounded by those, but it's a good gut check as to why we fell in love with these cars in the first place. What is it that made these things so good right out of the box? And so I've been keeping it much the way it is because of that. It's got Coney shocks, because of course the stock ones were done some time ago. Um, I think it's got our frame rails on it. It's got a shock tower brace, cannon brace on the rear, a couple little, couple little uh, brace reinforcements. Um, I think Jeff Anderson uh, updated the radio back in 1999. 
there's been a couple of little things like that, but fundamentally, oh, a set of flying me out of sway bars. Fundamentally, this is the car that Mazda designed in the first place. It's even still running 185, 60, 14 tires, which are getting a little hard to find these days. Um, so that's, it's a really good gut check as to why it is we like these cars so much. And I, it's good for me to drive one of these once in a while so I can recalibrate myself on are we really making these better <laughs> doing these things that we're doing or you know, how good can one of these ride? How, what does the handling of a stock one feel like compared to you know, after all the things we've done to them? It's good to make sure you've got that baseline to go back to. Um, yeah, and that's, I mean, I keep it stock partly for sentimental reasons or, or I keep it the way it is partly for sentimental reasons, but also just because it is good like that. I have crazy modified Miatas, ones that don't have anything except for a title in common with the original car. And this is the, uh, this is the counterpoint to that. So anything that's been done to it has been done to simply make it a little bit better. It's got you know, upgraded headlights because we always used to upgrade headlights back in the day. Kony socks, that's a given. I would like to give a shout out to Kony. Um, when I was doing some work on this car recently, I replaced all of its suspension bushings. I'll get to that in a moment. I found out that one of the front shocks was uh, leaking. I had installed that shock in 1999. It's 23 years old. And Kony, of course, has a lifetime warranty for the original purchaser. And they stood beside it behind it and it has a brand new warrantied Coney shock on it. So kids, if you're going to buy Coney shocks, buy them from an authorized Coney dealer and keep your seats <laughs> because the lifetime warranty is real. Um, anything Mike? Yeah. Can you talk about the differences between the Canadian spec versus US spec? Okay. Well, the question was differences between the Canadian and US spec cars, which is the next thing on my list. So th good segue. Thank you, Mike. So generally speaking, interesting note, Canada bought more Miatas per capita than the US did in the early days. They were, they were bigger sellers um, for the first few years and they held their value extremely well. Um, I had a friend bought a 1993 new and he sold it. I basically drove it for free for at least the first three or four years. So also a very large number of them got exported to Europe and overseas. Um, some friends of mine who live in Germany have more yellow Canadian uh, 92s in their uh, local club than the Ottawa club did. So there you go. So Travis, come on over here and we'll, sh we'll look at the most obvious difference in a Canadian car. And that is they didn't have airbags. Now this isn't a difference. If you're from Europe, um, you're used to seeing them without airbags as well. But in the US, they were never sold without airbags. So it's got this steering wheel that if you're used to it, I mean, a lot of, a lot of Brits think it's ugly. I think it's quite attractive. It's certainly much better than the airbag one. Um, but that also means it has different switch gear. The combos, the, the stocks for the combo switch, well, this is, it gets into wiring. There's no headlight relay. So all of the power for the headlights goes through these switches. And so they've got great big um, contacts in them and they feel really good to use. They've got this solid feel that you don't get with the American ones. They're also nice and straight. I think they have a much more attractive design to them myself. But I mean, the new, the different steering wheel means a different column, different shroud, different stocks, and weirdly, different windshield wiper motor, it's wired backwards. <laughs> I don't know why, it's got switched ground instead of switched, uh, switched power or vice versa, I forget which way it goes. You can convert a US car to this steering column and switches, I've done that sort of thing, but it's not exactly a bolt-in. There's a surprising number of components are affected by that. Even this little, um, the knee guard, or whatever we want to call it, underneath the steering column in the US, it's a plate that's made out of like depleted uranium or something. Uh, on these cars, it's light plastic. Go figure. So that's, that's the most obvious change. I'll show you another one under the hood. Shoop. This is kind of a funny one. It's an indication of the different climates that you're gonna come across. This thing is considerably larger than the washer bottle on, a, uh, on an American car because, I mean, that's the nature of Canadian roads. <laughs> You're going to need your washer bottle a lot. So it's got this enormous washer bottle, which used to give us trouble with fitment with our old shock tire braces. It also has a difference in the coolant gauge. And I can't show you this because I've been playing around with some other stuff, so it's got a U.S. cluster in it right now. But the Canadian gauge cluster looks the same. It's in metric. But the temperature gauge, when it's at normal temperature, sits just above center. In the American cars, it sits just below center. And my theory on that is that Americans are afraid of their cars overheating and Canadians are afraid of, their, of freezing to death. That's my, I've never had confirmation of that, but why would they make the gauges read higher? I, I don't know. <laughs> there you go. 
Um, they also had daytime running lights. They were one of the first cars on the road with daytime running lights in Canada, so you could always spot a Miata from a distance because they, they run their turn indicator bulbs, the high voltage bulb, or the high wattage bulb that's back here, all the time. And then for turn indicators, they flash them on and off instead of them being off and then flashing on. But it meant that you could always spot a Miata because you had these, these uh, yellow bulbs coming at you from down the road, whereas nothing else was, everything else used the headlights in the early days. So there you go. I think that's it. Uh, do we have anything else going on over there, Mike? Okay. The other um, less obvious one is that Canadian cars, especially early ones, are very unlikely to have air conditioning, <laughs> like this one. Um, it's a convertible car in Canada. I mean, seriously, what are you going to do with air conditioning? Now, Canadians have discovered that air conditioning is kind of a good thing. Back in 1990, we weren't doing that. So there you go. No air conditioning. I will show you one thing inside that's got nothing to do with the history of the car. It's got nothing to do with what's going on, but it's kind of fun in terms of what I've been playing with, and this is why it's good to have a standard stock car sitting around, but if there's no questions about this, Mike, no questions, okay. It's basically, it's just a 1990 Miata, but it's in good shape. It's a driver condition car. It's not pristine, it's got a little bit of, it's obviously been repaired on this back corner at some point, it's got clear coat on that panel, um, but fundamentally, it's just, it's clean, it's been uh, maintained well for the last 20 years, and it's just fun to drive. So Travis, you wanna come in here and uh, have a look in the passenger's door. I'll show off what's going on. I've talked in the past, I've talked in the past about doing race gauges, putting LEDs behind here. You, you look back in our YouTube channel, you'll see a few of these. And over the course of the, the winter break, I decided to see if I could come up with a gauge. You know, it's, we, for years we've been putting two inch gauges in the uh, eyeball vents, but you lose the vent. And so I decided that I'm gonna come up with a gauge that you can still read when the vent is in. So here we go. Wake up, whoop. I put LEDs in around here. <laughs> I've got a little demo thing. I'll make it do a little dance. There we go. So basically there's 24 LEDs behind each of these things. I have it wired into the back of the cluster so I can have it do things. I could explain what it's doing, but let's just make it do a dance again. It's more fun. This is just a display. It can do whatever you want to. I've got it set up to the tachometer and a shift light in here right now. This is set up to an accelerometer, so it shows friction circle stuff. Why is it interesting in a stock car? Because it's working off a stock car. This doesn't rely on an aftermarket ECU. It doesn't rely on CAN bus or anything like that. It's actually reading all the stuff right off the back of the gauge cluster. And that's part of our design for the race dash product that we're coming out with soon. We're just finalizing pricing and suppliers at the moment. But it will allow us to put LEDs behind, say, the tachometer that read off a stock cluster. And so I'm using this car as a test. This is obviously as stock as they get. So if we can make it work here, we can make it work in whatever you're driving. So kind of a fun thing. And that's, I also came up with this little switch plate so I could make it do different things by pressing different buttons, make it disappear, whatever. So <laughs> it's just, this is what I do when I have a week of spare time. Do you have any questions, Mike? Nope. Okay, well, not a long talk, um, but there you go. It's a stock Miata, right down to the exhaust. Um, actually, even the, even the soft top is original. It's still got a 1990 soft top on it. It's starting to show a couple of small cracks up on the top corners, but it still works. This car is interesting because it was, it's from, so we say the rust belt, a place where cars rust out hard but because it was never driven in the winter, it never suffered the sort of rust. And because it was a Northern car, it never got the sun burning that we got in the, on the Southwestern cars. So it doesn't have a cracked dashboard, doesn't have the plastics all burnt out, doesn't have the rear window that's you know, basically turned opaque and black. So it's, it's just basically a survivor, which is kind of fun to have. When I drove it here from Ottawa, I got stuck in a, in a snowstorm in the middle of the Rockies, and it was the first time it had seen snow this century. So. That's, uh, that's a pretty good history. So there you go. If you have any questions about Miata 338, uh, please do put them in the, uh, in the comments. Um, we'll answer them as best we can if you want to know anything. Uh, one of the questions that was asked during, the, uh, during our quest for, for questions, no, it's not for sale. My car, you can't have it. So there you go. If you want a nice clean, uh, nice clean 1990, you're gonna have to go find it somewhere else. So um, if you like this sort of stuff, do all the social media stuff, like, comment, subscribe. We have YouTube channels, we have Facebook pages, we have Instagram, we have our own website. 
Who knows what we'll have in the future? I don't know. Someone's trying to get me on Telegram. I don't know. Whatever. I'm too old for this stuff. So <laughs> we'll see you again next week. My name is Keith Tanner. Thanks for your attention from Flying Miata. Right. Bye.